Hello and welcome to Season 2, Episode 9 of Arbing Brief, your practical video guide on hand-picked arbitration issues. Arbing Brief is produced in collaboration with IRA Pledge and Dallas Dispute Resolution, and Season 2 is sponsored by LALIF. My name is Vanessa Meirelles. I am part of the Arbing Brief team and practice international arbitration with Luther in Hamburg, Germany. I have the pleasure of moderating today's discussion on multi-tier dispute resolution clauses and construction disputes featuring Aisha Nadar and Chantelle Humphreys. Aisha works with Avocat Firma Runland, based in Stockholm, Sweden, and act, acts as arbitrator, mediator, adjudicator, and is often involved in all phases of negotiation, implementation, dispute resolution of large-scale cross-border infrastructure projects. Chantel acts as advocate at Rivonia Group of Advocates and divides her practice between South Africa and England. She also acts as arbitrator, adjudicator, and mediator in construction disputes and general commercial litigation. Today's topic, topic uh, multi-tier multi dispute resolution clauses, provide for distinct stages involving separate procedures and efforts to be taken by the parties prior to resorting to arbitration or litigation. They often involve or escalate from more amicable and flexible mechanisms in negotiation, mediation, or conciliation to more adversarial ones, um, such as expert determination, dispute boards, arbitration, and litigation. In an attempt to avoid or at least mitigate the costs and effects of long proceedings by giving the parties more chances to come together and try to resolve their dispute. Such provisions are especially common in construction contracts. Solving construction disputes is tricky. On the one hand, um, there are almost always many facts and technical details involved, while on the other hand, the parties are in a hurry as a project waits for their dispute to be resolved. But do multi-tiered clauses really help? From arbitration perspective, they are often seen as a jurisdiction and admissibility concern, delaying the start of the proceedings. Still, the International Industry Standard for Construction Infrastructure Projects recommend parties to go through a multi-tier process before initiating arbitra arbitration. Aisha and Chantel are here to share with us their expertise and experience with these clauses and how to use them effectively. Aisha, thank you for being here. In your opinion, what are the advantages of multi-tier dispute resolution clauses? When can they be helpful in solving construction disputes and when are they not so suitable? Vanessa, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers and uh, you and Rupa for uh, inviting me to join today. It's uh, delightful. And uh, I'll, to address your question, I think I'll start by saying, if you look at a multi-tiered clause from an arbitration perspective looking backwards, sometimes it, it's then a sword where people are using it to prevent you from getting to arbitration, uh, jurisdiction issues, admissibility issues, and the like. But what I'd invite the participants to think about is um, the introduction of these multi-tiered clause is more uh, a forward-looking approach. If we look at the characteristics and the nature of construction contracts in general, they're usually over a long period of time, years, it's measured in years, multiple parties, and, and somehow a, a mosaic of contracts to bring a, a project from completion, from conception to completion. And what features in most construction contracts, there are definitely many unknowns that are known today. We can take the example of uh, unforeseen site conditions. We know it may happen. So it requires that the parties come together and adjust their thinking in regard to price and schedule when those known unknowns or risks eventuate. And there is a multitude of those risks. So with this, the multi-tiered dispute resolution clause usually says, and you were right, um, you rightfully pointed out that it starts with an amicable approach because it is the parties renegotiating their agreement in terms of impact of the eventuate of this risk eventuating. If you encounter unforeseen site conditions, how much is that going to impact the contract in terms of schedule and or cost? 
And if the parties can come around and discuss that issue and reach agreement, I dare say it gives them a good chance to focus on uh, the success of the project and move forward and in fact avoid a potential dispute. So many times multi-tiered clauses, uh, when you think of them, they're not really addressing only disputes. They're addressing issues as they arise. And the intent is to solve, to bring these issues up in a timely manner and resolve these issues prior to their escalation such that you can avoid disputes in the first instance and resolve those disputes that do escalate in a timely manner because some escalation clauses then go on to have um, management look at a, a particular frame of a dispute or in um, interjecting one of the alternative spectrums or tools that are available similar to mediation or moving on to dispute boards, either a dispute review board or a dispute adjudication board and prior to getting to arbitration. So I think the utility um, is a forward looking focus to identify issues early, address those and resolve them, hopefully avoiding disputes or resolving disputes early before their escalation and getting to arbitration. So look, a positive forward look is their advantage more so than looking at them when you're in arbitration uh, where they really perform the, the focus of a, more of a, a sword than a shield against disputes. I hope that uh, I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chantal, do you, don't you think that maybe if you would uh, provide for faster arbitration, so emergency arbitration, could you have the same benefit of um, addressing the issues on a timely manner, um, more than having several steps? Hi, Vanessa. Um, thanks for having me here as well. Uh, firstly, I think I should say that I agree with Aisha's uh, commentary on the multi-tier dispute clauses. Um, we have to bear in mind that with fast-tracked arbitration or emergency arbitration, their use is normally limited to urgent relief that a party wouldn't normally be able to obtain um, you know, if the arbitration was to follow its normal course. The relief for emergency arbitrations is also not in all cases, but it can be limited to interim relief. So we need to look at what the purpose is of multi-tier dispute clauses to be able to determine whether or not the same objective can be achieved um, as with emergency arbitration. Now, I agree with what Aisha said that the, in my view, the main goal of multi-tier dispute resolution clauses is to nip things in the bud early. You almost want to prevent the dispute from becoming a full-blown dispute. So it's it's if the correct steps are followed, then you can actually prevent the dispute from escalating and ending up in arbitration. Now that's not the objective with emergency arbitrations or with expedited or with expedited arbitrations. Um, the purpose of expedited arbitration is to give you a quick remedy normally for interim relief. So multi, I mean, if multi-tier multi dispute resolution clauses are followed correctly, um, then the party's relationship can be improved, the continuance of the project can be improved, and generally the parties can end up in a much better result than they can if they went straight into arbitration. Um, saying that the success of a multi-tier dispute resolution clause also depends on a lot of factors. Um, for example, if the parties merely use the different tiers as steps or they, they, they simply get, get through them without really engaging in the process, then they serve absolutely no purpose. For example, if the first step is negotiation, and the parties first have to negotiate before they can go to adjudication. Um, but the parties see the negotiation as merely a step and they don't really engage in it with the aim of resolving the dispute before it actually turns into a dispute. 
then the negotiation will serve no purpose and the entire multi-tier dispute resolution process will fall apart. So I can also go on um, and talk about was, this for quite a I bit. Was going, sorry, I was going to, to go exactly on this point. Um, have either of you experienced um, a case, a construction case, in which uh, a clause that has only two steps, such as from the Dallas dispute resolution model, where they, it provides for negotiation before going to arbitration. Have either of you uh, experienced that just having one additional step before arbitration was in, enough to de-escalate the dispute and have the parties come together and not, not end up in arbitration? Aisha. I, yeah, I, I have seen that work, but I will do, um, remind what Chantel said. If the parties are just engaged in it as a step, and don't have um, the, the view of resolving their uh, dispute, then it's, it's taken as a step. Um, but I think structuring those negotiations is when I see it succeed. Um, when parties add some meat to the bones on this two-step approach, what does it mean to negotiate? Does it mean uh, to have a common set of facts in front of the CEOs? Um, and then allow them to negotiate? How do you escalate the information to your management such that you give them a good chance at escalation? Having some protocol around what it means to have that two steps I've seen succeed, but that protocol needs to um, focus on what's the relationship of the parties as it is, and how it is to get the information to the people that are actually going to be negotiating. Okay, and what about you, Chantel? Yeah, so I think we know that most uh, standard form of construction contracts provide for more than one um, method to resolve the dispute. So it's normally negotiation, adjudication, then arbitration. Um, and yes, they, they can be very successful if they are used correctly. Um, but, adjudications is, is very is a very similar process to, to, to the arbitration. So in my view, you would have to add at least three steps, at least to a multi-tier dispute resolution for it to be truly successful and to prevent de-escalation of the dispute. Okay. Oh, that, that, that adds a couple of steps. <laughs> um, in your experience also, do you think it helps to have this mechanism framed by institutions? Um, yeah, both. You can go, Aisha. Uh, just particularly for state parties, I, I think they, the, the having an institution uh, provides a safe pair of hands. I mean, I, 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 so having some institutional rules for these steps, I find sometimes useful. Okay. Yeah, and from my side, I think that's anything that can give the party certainty as to the process or what steps they have to follow can only be of assistance. Um, so yes, I agree that institutional rules can be and are helpful. Oh, that's, that's great. Um, well, I think we have to uh, cut our discussion here and jump to the Q&A. Thank you so much, Aisha and Chantel, for a very insightful and inspiring discussion. Uh, we also thank our partner organizations, Dallas Dispute Resolution and Era Pledge, as well as the sponsor of our second season, Lalit. To see future Abbey Brief videos, please follow us on LinkedIn and like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We love to hear your comments and feedback, and you can re register for our next episode in abbeybrief.com. We look forward to seeing you there.